Well, after that wonderful introduction, I think I don't have to talk. <laughs> I think I can uh, sit down. Thank you, Stephen. Those were very kind words. And this is a very special moment for me and my family and my colleagues. It's a chance to look back on what we've been able to do, and it's a chance to thank many people who have helped and made this work possible. There are a small but sizable number of people who actually perform some of these experiments here today, and enough, another much larger group of people uh, who are not here, and then a third group of people who participated in supporting these experiments from behind the scenes, both in terms of enthusiastic encouragement uh, and also in terms of funding this research. This was very expensive research, and it continues to be so, unfortunately. Now, if I can begin with the first slide. So today I want to talk about prions. I think that's no secret. And I want to speak about the human prion diseases, which are shown at the top, Carew, creutzfeldt jakob disease, gerstmann streusler shanker disease, and fatal familial insomnia, and then scrapie of sheep, and mad cow disease of cattle. Now, the first three disease, human diseases were all transmitted to non-human primates in the laboratories of Carlton Gajicek and Joe Gibbs, beginning in 1966. But before we talk about these diseases, I think it's important for me to define a few terms. So scrapie is a fatal neurodegenerative disease of sheep and goats. It can be transmitted to rodents for laboratory studies. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the human counterpart. It usually presents with a dementia and death within a year. It is manifest as a sporadic, inherited, or infectious illness. This is a very important aspect of the disease process, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. The term prion uh, is defined as a proteinaceous infectious particle that lacks nucleic acid, and I will argue that it's composed entirely of an abnormal isoform of a cellular protein. Thus, a prion is an infectious protein. These prions are the infectious pathogens causing scrapie and CJD, and of course, mad cow disease. The normal form of the prion protein, PRPC, is encoded by a chromosomal gene. It has a high alpha helical content and little beta sheet, whereas PRP scrapie, the abnormal isoform of the prion protein, acquires a high beta sheet content when it is formed post-translationally. Now, one can think about how this might have all developed had molecular genetics been the tool which was used to dissect this work, and I think it's interesting to look at that for a moment. The first cases of familial CJD and, G and GSS were recognized in the 1930s. Now, this is a pedigree that was put together in 1968, but beginning with the observations in the 1930s of Megendorfer and Stender. And it was clear from the beginning that this looked like an autosomal dominant disease. It clearly was not a recessive disease. Now, in these people, the pathology looked like it looks in mice. This is a slide by Steve DeArmond, who's here today, uh, where there was spongiform degeneration and gliosis, and this is a technique that they did not have available to them. This is a histoblot, a technique developed by Albert Tarabolis and Steve DeArmond that shows PRP scrapie, and of course, they didn't know about PRP scrapie at the time. Now, it's very interesting to think about what would have things have been like if uh, the genetics had preceded the transmissibility. But that's not how it evolved. What evolved was that people thought for many years that these diseases were caused by viruses. And the reason they thought the diseases were caused by viruses is because these diseases, particularly scrapie, the prototypic disease, is transmissible. The agent is small and filterable. There's a rise in scrapie agent titer that precedes the disease, and there's strains of scrapie agent, which we will talk about later, that produce different patterns of disease. 
Now, the idea of a virus was a reasonable one until the middle 1960s. And then something really terrible happened. It was the work of Tig Valper that provoked quite a reaction. What she did was to study the relative inactivation at 250 nanometers and 280 nanometers, the X's. And she found that the scrapie agent was 10 to 1,000 times more resistant than most viruses that had been studied. But she also found that there was an equal resistance at 250 and 280. Now, she looked at a paper by Richard Setlow in 1957. This was almost 10 years earlier. And she compared her data with that for aldolase. And aldolase is inactivated by UV light by destruction of the aromatic amino acids. And so aldolase is much more sensitive at 280 than 250. So she concluded that a protein was not involved, and neither was a nucleic acid. Now, the next year, a man named John Griffith ignored her comparison with alveolase and in a very prescient speculation suggested that conformational changes in proteins were the basis of the scrapie agent. We'll come back to this in much greater detail. Now, in 1970, Tig Valper added this point at 237 nanometers with the help of Raymond Latterjee in Paris. And this confounded things much more, because no one was then clear at all what this meant. Some people thought that this rep the fact that the scrapie agent was six times more sensitive at 237 nanometers than 250 or 280 meant there were modified nucleosides involved or that there were carbohydrates that gave a spectrum like that. But a year ago, this was cleared up when I gave a talk at the Brookhaven Laboratory and Richard Setlow, who was still alive and doing experiments, said to me, if only Tigfa Alper had compared the inactivation spectrum of scrapie to trypsin instead of aldolase, she would have seen these circles that fell right on top of scrapie, and the whole problem would have been solved. But I guess it's my good fortune that she didn't do that. <laughs> now, The work began to move ahead when I carried out a set of initial studies with Bill Hadlow and Carl Eklund at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory. <coughs> Excuse me. And the initial studies that we carried out used endpoint titrations that required 60 mice and one year. These studies uh, were very slow. And following the lead of Richard Kimberlin and Richard Marsh, we moved to the hamster in the late 1970s. And with that move, we were able to develop an incubation time assay that accelerated our work about 100-fold. That meant that we could do in one year what would have required previously 100 years to do. And since most investigators don't have a lifetime even approaching 100 years, uh, this meant that we really could make a lot of progress. Now, with Darlene Groth's help and a number of other people, we developed an effective purification scheme that took advantage of the resistance of the infectivity to nuclease digestion and to limited protease digestion. And we eventually found a protein, which we called PRP2730, because it had a nominal molecular size of 20 to 7 to 30,000 Daltons. Now, prior to the isolation of that protein, we were trying to characterize the fractions in terms of their resistance to procedures that modify nucleic acids. And we extended the work of Tig Valper using four additional procedures, and also looking at procedures that modify proteins. And we found that after a partial purification, the removal of about 99% of the material which uh, was contaminating our preparations, in other words, unwanted uh, cellular macromolecules, that Every time we used a procedure that modified proteins specifically, we reduced the infectivity. But procedures that modified nucleic acids did not alter the infectivity of these partially purified preparations. And so I coined the term prion at that time, and this set off quite a storm, bigger than the one that Tig Valper set off when she reported her initial radiation data. 
And I did this to try to distinguish the scrapie agent from both viroids and viruses, as Stefan Normark has remarked about. And this is me at the time with brown hair and the reaction of the scientific community. <laughs> oh, this one's in sideways. Can we, we'll leave it like this. This is a surrealistic painting of Magritte. Now, normally it's set with, this was the ground, this was the bottom. But I'm not sure that this matters. <laughs> now, this has a very rich history for me. And that's because there was a, an exhibition of Magritte paintings, who was one of the great uh, surrealists of the 20th century, here in Stockholm in 1967, when I came here as a medical student to work with Ulla Lindberg. And at, at the same time, Barbara Cannon arrived. And exactly about the same time, Lars Ernster moved from the Wenner-Gren Institute to take over the chair of biochemistry. So there was a lot of confusion and a lot of movement at that time at the Wenner-Gren Institute. And it was my good fortune to come and to be able to work with Ulla and Barbara on the brown adipose tissue problem for a while. But then I had to leave and go back to medical school, and I had to face either going to the NIH, which wasn't so bad, or Vietnam at the time, which was a horrible thought. Now, this slide is wonderful. And you've all read it already. Men occasionally stumble across the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. Now, that's very true. But fortunately, we had a lot of data. And the data kept staring me in the face and kept pushing me to get more data to try to convince people that somewhat, some of what I was saying was correct. And I was very fortunate to have a lot of wonderful collaborators. Now, once we found the protein, we began a collaboration with Leroy Hood. And Darlene Groth, along with Steve Kent, working uh, in Leroy Hood's lab at Caltech, uh, determined the N-terminal sequence of the protein PRP2730. Now, this was no more easy than the earlier studies because it was another biochemical nightmare. Because in the Edmund degradation, there were two amino acids in the first cycle, two amino acids in the second cycle, and three amino acids in the third cycle. But fortunately, Steve Kent, after working on this for quite a while, was very clever. And he took all of these minor signals and he made two groups, the major minor signals and the weakest minor signals. And then he moved the major minor signals, two amino acids to the right. That's here. And he moved the weaker minor signals, two amino acids to the left. And you can see that they all now line up, and we had one sequence. Now, we published that. And Bruce Cheesebro at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory, working independently, retrieved molecular clones from a mouse brain library. And then in a collaborative study with Leroy Hood and Charles Weissman in Zurich, and Bruno Ursch, a student working with him at the time, we retrieved cDNA clones from a hamster brain library. So now we could begin the molecular biology. Now, the fact that we found a messenger RNA, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, in our preparations from normal animals, suggested that there had to be a normal protein encoded by the gene. And that protein is shown here on a western blot. This is PRPC, and when the protein uh, preparations are digested prior to denaturation and, and electrophoresis, this protein disappears. It's very sensitive. Over here is PRP scrapie and PRPC, a dimer of PRP scrapie are in higher ordered multimers. But when we digest with proteinase K, we see that we have a shortened protein which is N terminally truncated. All of that is made more clear on this linear diagram where you see PRPC and PRP scrapie and then PRP2730, the protein that we originally found, in which it's missing about 67 amino acids. But this point right here is a ragged end terminus, as I told you. Now, PRPC and PRP scrapie are derived from a longer polypeptide of about 250 amino acids with an end terminal signal peptide, a C terminal signal sequence. There's a GPI anchor, a glycolipid anchor, two N-linked carbohydrates, and a disulfide. We believe 
from the work of Mike Baldwin and Neil Stahl that the covalent structure of PRPC and PRP scrapie are the same. Now, having put all that data together, we took an independent approach. And this is work that was carried out in collaboration with George Carlson. Now, George is here today, and George and I began a series of studies several years earlier where we were crossing red mice and blue mice. And we were following the work of Alan Dickinson in Scotland, who had been doing the same type of work for many years. And Alan Dickinson had identified a gene through genetic crosses that he called SYNC, which controlled the incubation time for scrapie. But unfortunately, he wouldn't give us the blue mice, but we were able to find another mouse at the Jackson Laboratory, which behaved like his long incubation time mouse. And with the cDNA probe and the help of Dave Kingsbury, we were able to show genetic linkage between control of incubation times in mice with short and long incubation times and the PRP gene. The next year, Dave Westaway and Carol Cooper sequenced the allele, the PRP allele, from the long incubation time mice and found that it differed at two amino acids from the one that had been reported by Bruce Cheesebro two, two years earlier at residues 108 and 189. Now, at the same time, uh, Bruce Miller at UCLA, a neurologist, was following a patient with GSS. And Bruce knew of my interest in this disease and asked me if I would like to have uh, to see the patient. And I took some blood. We isolated the DNA. And Karen Chow, a neurologist who had just finished her residency, came to the laboratory. And she began a series of sequencing studies. And she found that in, the, in the, one of the alleles of this patient, that at the second position of codon 102, there was a substitution that led to a change where a leucine was now in place of a proline. We did a genetic linkage study with the help of Tim Crow, Rosalind Ridley, Harry Baker, and their colleagues in London because they had a very large family that had the same mutation, it turned out, uh, when they looked after we told after we uh, had some DNA from them and found that mutation, and we showed significant linkage. Now, what I want to point out is that these genetic studies did not depend upon scrapie infectivity. They were totally independent of that. It was, it was a totally independent line of inquiry that gave us the same answer, that PRP was essential and that PRP was intimately involved in these diseases. Now, at the same time, there was another line of evidence that arose. In the early 1960s, Ian Pattison coined the term the species barrier. This is the barrier for transmission of the scrapie agent from one species to another. He was working at Compton, England. And of course, there's great importance in the species barrier now, and I'll come back and talk more about the possible transmission of bovine prions to humans a little later. But in 1989, when these other studies were being carried out, Mike Scott, who's also here, uh, created transgenic mice that carried a hamster PRP gene. And by doing so, he was able to abrogate the species barrier completely. In other words, when he did this, the mouse behaved just like a hamster with respect to prions. The mice were now very susceptible to hamster prions, whereas non-transgenic mice were very resistant. Now, there were many attempts made to falsify the prion hypothesis. And such attempts involved trying to separate scrapie infectivity from protein and, more specifically, PRP scrapie. There are no preparations of purified prions that contain less than one PRP scrapie molecule per infectious unit. And as expected, there's no replication in PRP deficient mice. Now, there have been four different lines of PRP-deficient mice made. The first ones were made by Charles Weissman and his colleagues in Zurich, and they're the ones that we used in an independent study to determine whether or not this was the case. And Detlef Riesner carried out a ser long series of studies in collaboration with us looking for a scrapie-specific nucleic acid, but none was found. Now, as time went on, the opposition began to atrophy. That's a neurologic term. <laughs> and you see pro this progressive withering of this arm 
and eventually the declaration that prions really exist. And you can see the change in me over time. <laughs> now, there are many, many pieces of data that have gone into this work. But I've listed four major points, uh, and I just want to review them as kind of an outline for much of what I'll talk about in the remainder of the talk. In 1982, it became very clear that prions contained protein, and it was very doubtful that we would find a nucleic acid, but it wasn't certain. The protein PRP2730, which is the protease-resistant core of PRP scrapie, was identified. By 1989, it was clear that mutations in the PRP gene caused the, caused the inherited forms of the disease, and also that foreign transgenes could abrogate the species barrier. By 1993, I'll talk much more about this, it became clear that there was a conformational change involved uh, that distinguished the cellular form of the prion protein shown here, uh, this, and I'll talk much more about uh, this <laughs> uh, structure in a moment, and the scrapey form of the prion protein shown as a cartoon right here. And then in 1996, it became clear that the one remaining obstacle to accepting prions was that of prion strains. And at that point, it became clear that the con there were multiple conformations of PRP scrapie and that they enciphered the information for different strains. And I'll speak much more about that toward the end of the talk. Now, how did we come to the notion that it was a conformational change that was involved? And I've tried to summarize uh, very briefly the lines of thinking that went into this and the progression. So initially, we thought perhaps that transcriptional regulation was involved and that the PRP gene, uh, when it was found, would be turned off, and in scrapie, it would be turned on. But that wasn't the case. It was constitutively expressed. And there was some concern on the part of my collaborators at the time that we had isolated the wrong protein after eight years of work. And in fact, one of the studies, that of Bruce Cheesebro, expressed exactly that sentiment. Now, when we carried out studies to determine the gene structure with Charles Weissman, it became very clear that the entire protein coding region was found within a single exon. So alternative splicing could not explain the difference between PRPC, the normal cellular protein, and the scrapie form, the disease form. Then we looked for six years, the work of Neil Stahl and Mike Baldwin, who I've already mentioned, for a post-translational chemical modification. And we were getting nowhere with that. And I was very fortunate because Jerry Fishback, who was at St. Louis and then moved to Harvard at, uh, around that time, published the sequence of chicken PRP that was only 30% homologous with mammalian PRP. And I took that sequence to Fred Cohn. And Fred Cohn, who is a computational uh, biologist and who is here, uh, took that information, working with one of the postdoctoral fellows in the laboratory, and came back and said, well, I wonder if PRPC isn't a four helix bundle protein. It turns out to be a three helix bundle protein. And that perhaps then, and there was a lot of information to suggest that PRP scrapie had a high beta sheet content, that this is really the difference between PRPC and PRP scrapie. And it turns out that that is the case. And it turns out, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that there are multiple confirmations of PRP scrapie. And we'll examine the implications of that a little later. Now, this is the first model, or set of models, three-dimensional models, that Fred Cohn and his student, Ziwei Wang, constructed. So this was PRPC, a four helix bundle protein. This is one of 300,000 different structures, but based on the biology and the little structural information we had and various mutations, Fred thought that this might be the most plausible. So the end terminus would lie out here, the first putative helix, a loop, the second putative helix, then another loop, and try to remember that this, uh, this yellow loop, and then the two gray helices in the background and the glycolipid anchor. Now, these two gray helices are stabilized by the single disulfide bond, and that's what made Fred, Fred and Ziwei think that perhaps it was most likely with PRP scrapie that the 
two helices in the background, the gray ones, stabilized by this disulfide bond, would remain intact, and that the protein at the N-terminal region, the polypeptide chain at the N-terminal region, would turn into these beta strands to form a sheet. Now, it's remarkable how correct Fred was. There's small differences in what he predicted and what we know now, but we don't know the whole story at a structural level still. This is the NMR structure of a 142 amino acid fragment that corresponds to that protease resistant fragment that I told you about that is generated after limited proteolysis of PRP scrapie, but all the infectivity remains. But this fragment is made in E. coli and it is not infectious. It contains these two helices that were in gray, stabilized by a disulfide bond, but then in that long yellow loop, it turned out that there's a small helix, and then the first two helices, the red and the green ones, we can't find, at least under the conditions that these studies were done by Tom James in San Francisco in collaboration with Peter Wright and Jane Dyson at Scripps in La Jolla. I should mention that there, a year earlier, there was a structure of 111 amino acids. So we were missing a number of amino acids out here at the end terminus of this molecule. But in th that fragment by Kurt Wutrich, essentially the same structural features were seen, except these helices were considerably shorter, these two long ones. And interestingly, that fragment, when expressed in mice, by Adriano Aguzzi and Charles Weissman was found to be highly neurotoxic. So how it differs from PRPC is not clear. Let me just, let me point out one other thing. Now, when PRPC from, from the brains of animals was isolated by K-Ming Pan, what he found was that the protein, just as Fred had predicted, was very high in alpha helical content and virtually devoid of beta sheet. And that's in contrast to Kaming Pan's work and that of a number of other people. Uh, and that was predicted many years earlier by, structure, by studies showing that PRP scrapie, again this cartoon, can polymerize into amyloid, which is always high in beta sheet. And we found that the full length molecule was very high in beta sheet and contained less uh, alpha helix. Now, here you see, again, an E. coli-derived molecule. So this is a recombinant PRP, but this is now a full-length molecule. And this is a structure uh, done by David Dunn, Peter Wright, Shane Dyson, and Fred Cohn. Now, in this full-length molecule, we don't have any evidence for a small amount of beta sheet. So we, we believe that this is a three-helix bundle protein with a very long stretch, which is highly flexible. So the red regions are extremely flexible, and the more ordered regions are the blue regions up in here. And this is the region which I was showed you before, which was blown up and much bigger. So this is the C terminus of the molecule, the N terminus, the first small helix, then the second helix, helix B, and then the third helix, and the C terminus. Now, we don't understand exactly what's happening to this very highly flexible region. But we think that the highly flexible region may be much more rigid in uh, the animal because, in fact, it may be complexed with copper. And this is just a small diagram showing you the histidines that may be involved and the glycines that may be involved in complexing these copper atoms. Now, we, there are five of these octorepeats which have glycine and proline and histidine. And a number of investigators have suggested that copper might be important. But I think now, with this full-length protein, we're beginning to get a very interesting picture. This is supplemented by the work of Hans Kretschmer and his colleagues, who've used the PRP-deficient mice and shown that superoxide dismutase levels are very low. Superoxide dismutase is an enzyme that uses copper, it requires copper, and it's been found to be a good indicator of copper metabolism. So it may well be that at least one function, or at least part of the function of PRPC, involves copper. Now when it comes to the scrapey form of the protein, 
there's been a lot of progress made in localizing the changes that occur. And the experimental work has confirmed what was predicted by Fred Cohn and Ziwei Wang. Here you see a series of antibodies that were made that we've listed as one, two, and three. These are recombinant antibodies made by Dennis Burton and Anthony Williamson at Scripps. And in collaboration with David Peretz in San Francisco, these antibodies have been used to localize the change in PRP scraping. So what you see is that antibodies out here toward the end terminus react with PRPC, but they do not react with PRP scraping. Unless the protein is denatured, so it's completely un, uh, <coughs> unfolded, and then the denatured form of the protein reacts robustly with the antibodies. In contrast, antibodies to the C terminus react very well both with PRPC and folded PRP scrapie, which is infectious, and there is relatively little increase when the protein is denatured. Now, similar results have been obtained recently with, by Bruno Wirsch and Karsten Korth and others working in Zurich with a different approach using monoclonal antibodies, but essentially the same results. Now, we believe that PRPC exists in equilibrium with a metastable intermediate that we call PRP star, which binds to a protein called protein X that I'll talk more about in a moment, and that this complex of PRP star and protein X then bind PRP scrapie. But PRP scrapie binds only to PRPC and not to protein X, and by a process that we don't understand, when <laughs> PRP star is turned into a second molecule of PRP scrapie, then protein X is recycled. And then more PRP scrapie binds to this complex of protein X and PRP star. Now, if we can turn the lights down a little bit, this is PRPC by electron microscopy, and we've used immunostaining to demonstrate the PRPC. This is Mike McKinley's work uh, initially, and then uh, work by uh, Jack Nguyen and Holger Willey. This is PRP scrapie. Again, we see the protein by immunostaining by the little gold dots, but we see no ordered arrays. But if we treat the PRP scrapie preparations with protease to form the protease-resistant core, which is still infectious, PRP2730, in the presence of detergent, the protein polymerizes into these amyloid shape, uh, <coughs> I should say these rod-shaped uh, structures that are indistinguishable from amyloids. Now, there have been times when some investigators call these rods scrapie-associated fibrils, but for years, Patricia Mers and Henry Wisniewski, who were the first to isolate these fibrils in 1981, the scrapie-associated fibrils, insisted they were not amyloid. But this distinction in recent years has become blurred. More importantly, I want to make it very clear that PRP scrapie does not form ordered arrays. And this, I think, has important implications for how a second molecule of PRP scrapie is made. Fred Cohn and I have pushed the idea that I showed you in the previous slide of this template-assisted PRP scrapie formation, while other investigators like Peter Lansbury and Byron Coe have argued for large aggregates that look like this in the, for the formation of a second molecule of PRP scrapie at the end of such an aggregate, but as I showed you here, none exist. Now, an important clue to the replication mechanism for prions came from work that was carried out initially by Mike Scott and then by Glenn Telling. In that work, we were interested in transmitting human prions to mice expressing human PRP genes. Earlier work, as I told you about, we had abrogated the species barrier using hamster PRP. But what we found was that these mice had very long incubation times and only a few mice got sick and they were no better than the non-transgenic mice. But when a chimeric PRP gene was made that was one-third mouse, one-third human, and one-third mouse, what we found was that all the animals would get sick at about 200 days after inoculation. We subsequently found taking the mice that Charles Weissman had produced, which were deficient for PRP, 
and crossing those with mice that carried the human PRP gene, that now all these mice would get sick. And this suggested to us that the mouse PRP, the product of the mouse PRP gene, was inhibiting the transmission of human prions into the mice that carried both the human PRP gene and the mouse PRP gene. And we suggested that mouse PRP was bind binding to a mouse protein, which we called protein X, which we thought acted like a chaperone. Now, in a series of really, truly brilliant studies by Kiyotoshi Kaneko, he mapped the site for protein X binding. We still don't know what protein X is, uh, but what he was able to do was to map this site near the C terminus of PRP C. So this is... This is now recombinant PRP. Uh, here is the C-terminus down here. And we're looking at this from the C-terminal side. And there are four amino acid residues that comprise this epitope. And, we and this was done by Kiyotoshi Kaneko, as I mentioned, with Fred Cohn's guidance. And we believe this is the binding site for protein X. Now, the interaction of PRPC with protein X explains uh, many different facets of Scrapie that uh, have been puzzling for many years. First of all, when basic residues are substituted in PRPC, they act as dominant negatives and prevent PRP Scrapie formation in cell culture. Nature has done such experiments in people. This is the work of Tetsuyuki Kitamoto and Yun Tatiishi in Japan, who found that people who carry a lysine instead of a glutamate at residue 219, this represents about 12% of the Japanese population, very, very rarely gets CJD. And in other studies carried out in multiple laboratories in the world, it's been known for quite a while that if there's a basic residue at residue one, at codon 171, that this basic residue, this arginine, uh, prevents scrapie in sheep. So there's a lot of evidence that uh, suggests that protein X does exist and that it binds to the site that I've told you about and it can explain many of what were seemingly disparate observations. Now, I want to make just a few remarks about the cell biology of prions. This slide summarizes about a dozen years of work in a half a dozen laboratories in different parts of the world. Byron Coey's work at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory, David Harris in St. Louis, and a number of people working in San Francisco and then working in different parts of the world. Albert Tarabolis back in Jerusalem, Mark Rogers in Dublin, uh, Daryl Butler, who's here today with us, uh, Martin Vey and Kiyotoshi Kaneko and Mike Scott in San Francisco, and many others. Now, PRPC is made in the endoplasmic reticulum, it's processed in the Golgi as it goes to the surface, where it's anchored by a glycolipid that was discovered by Niels Saul. The protein travels along the surface and into these cavioli-like domains. And in these domains, PRPC is either uh, initially uh, de <coughs> de degraded or it is converted into PRP scrapie. If the protein is targeted to the clathrin-coated pit, then no PRP scrapie is formed. We bypass this compartment completely. If, on the other hand, PRP scrapie is formed, it eventually makes its way th through the cytosol, uh, but in this luminal compartment, into the lysosome, and then is eventually released, at least in cell culture studies, and clearly in animals. Here we see in cells overexpressing PRPC at very high levels, an electron micrograph uh, made by Peter Peters in Utrecht, uh, showing the cavioli, these little cave-like structures near the surface of the cell with heavy staining by immu of, of immunogold of PRPC. And we, as I said, we believe that's the compartment where PRP scrapie is formed. Now let me change and talk about the human diseases for a moment. The human diseases come in three forms, the sporadic form, the inherited form, and the infectious form. As I mentioned in the beginning, I think we would have a completely different view of these diseases if we had started out with the inherited forms of the disease and we had been thinking about those. 
and we would have thought about a mechanism that could explain how an inherited disease, clearly established as inherited, could now also mimic a viral or bacterial-like disease. And what would we think about? What we would think about is that a protein must be involved in this, and that this protein needs to be amplified, and as the protein accumulates, this accumulated protein causes disease. And somehow this protein can trigger more of an abnormal form. And I think the last thing we would have thought about was a virus had things occurred in that sequence of events. But as I've already told you in exquisite detail, that's not how it happened. Now, it began, in fact, with humans, of course, with studies of Kuru by Carlton Gajusek and Vin Zegas and Michael Alpers in New Guinea, where Kuru was transmitted by ritualistic cannibalism. And more recently, iatrogenic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease uh, has become a very important issue with respect to growth hormone and duramater grafts. But by far, the most common form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the sporadic form that occurs at one per million across the Earth. Now, in terms of the infectious forms of the disease, one is quite worried about mad cow disease. And I think the cows are less worried than the humans now, because as you see, the number of cases of BSE is declining dramatically. And it's believed that's because of a feed ban that was put in place in 1988 shortly after the disease was discovered by Gerald Wells in the, late, in the middle 1980s. And it was thought to be due to the consumption of prion-contaminated meat and bone meal. This is a graph uh, of the epidemiology of this uh, disease by John Wildsmith at the Central Veterinary Lab near London. Now, this is the cover of Time magazine from April 1st, 1996. And, of course, it heralds an awful thought that people could get this disease. And that came at the time the British government announced 10 cases of a variant CJD in young people, three in teenagers and seven young adults. There are now over 25 cases of variant CJD. It has occurred in the correct place, Great Britain, with one French case. The timing is correct for there to be a relationship to the cows about a decade after the first BSE cases. But I should caution you and tell you that many people have looked for a link between scrapie of sheep and CJD of humans over a 25-year period, and none was found. But BSE is different. And BSE is different because there's a different protein with seven different amino acid side chains, and it may well be that the strain of BSE is unique and that it was created by this heating process, the rendering that was used to uh, produce the meat and bone meal. We just don't know at this point in time, but a large amount of data that is being accumulated by uh, uh, investigators in Great Britain, in particular, um, Maura Bruce and her colleagues, and John Collins and his colleagues, along with the initial studies of Bob Will, uh, Jim Ironside and Gene Bell argue that there is a connection. Now, if we can turn the lights down for a moment, uh, much to my chagrin, only a few days ago when I was in Britain for one day, all the newspapers had this on the front page. And the British government uh, carried out a series of studies where they were looking at bone marrow and trying to assay for prions uh, in non-transgenic mice and for the first time, they had evidence that there are prions in the bone marrow. And so they, after January 1, there will be no more beef sold on the bone. So people in Great Britain are now stocking up in their freezers on T-bone steaks. I can't understand that, but that's how it is. And the chefs are screaming that life will never be the same. Now, Mike Scott had been working for quite a while uh, and Glenn Telling participated in these studies to try to develop an assay system for bovine prions. And why the British government never wanted to fund these studies is beyond me, except that I think the last time they gave money to the colonies was when they sent it to General Howe to fight George Washington. <laughs> what you see here is that we have been successful in making a transgenic mouse model in which Bovine prions from cows are inoculated into mice, expressing the bovine PRP gene on the, the null mouse background, 
and all the mice are getting sick about 200 days after inoculation. Now, quite surprisingly, when we made a gene that was part mouse, part bovine, and part mouse, so just like the chimeric mouse-human mouse, it didn't work. The, the mice are completely resistant to bovine prions. So that was quite a surprise. Now, in the brains of the mice uh, that get sick after BSE with carrying the BSE transgene, this is work of Steve DeArmond, we see that uh, there's very little staining in the structures above the tentorium. The staining is primarily deep down in the brain stem uh, and in the cerebellum, much like in BSE. And we've learned something, I think, very important from this. And that is that here is the protein X binding site in blue. This is the interface between PRPC and PRP scrapie based on a number of studies. And we believe this is an additional part of the interface based upon the fact that these mice that carry the chimeric mouse, bovine mouse PRP gene are resistant to BSE prions. So we believe that the interface at which PRP scrapie and PRPC uh, interact is quite large and that it's defined both by the red side chains and the green side chains, whereas on the other side of the molecule is the protein X binding site. Now, I mentioned earlier the mutations and the work of Karen Chow. I want to point out two other mutations. There are now 20 known mutations of the PRP gene. So one of the mutations that, that will become very important in the last part of the talk is that which causes fatal familial insomnia at residue 178. Another mutation at residue 200. Now the 178 work was carried out by Pierre Luigi Gambetti in Cleveland and Elio Lugarese in Bologna. The 200 work has been carried out by two different groups. One in Israel, led by Ruth Gabazon and Odetta Bromsky and Zev Miner and Esther Kahana, and another uh, by Amos Korchin uh, and Lev Goldfarb working at the NIH with Carlton Gajasek. I also want to point out that these octa repeats, where we believe copper binds, the additional octa repeats are also responsible for familial forms of the disease. And there have been five different genetic linkage studies all underlined in green. So there is no question, I think, that these mutations cause the genetic forms of the disease. Now, we've studied some of the genetic forms in mice. And what we found is that we could transmit the disease from patients, Libyan Jews living in Israel, dying with the 200 mutation, or with fatal familial insomnia in the mice. But we were unable to reproduce the disease in mice if we simply express the transgene carrying that mutation. We also found, and this is Karen Chow's work, that if we express the 102 mutation, that the mice would get sick spontaneously, but we could not transmit the disease into mice carrying the wild-type gene. They had to express the same mutation, but at a very low level. And interestingly, this is, re this is residue 178, the phenotype, with a mutation here is regulated by this common polymorphism at codon 129. If it's a methionine as shown here, and there is a substitution of an asparagine for an aspartic acid, then we have fatal familial insomnia. The patients present with insomnia and autonomic nervous system dysfunction, whereas if this common polymorphism is a valine, then the patients present with a dementia. Now, the issue of prion strains, as I mentioned earlier, was an issue which really caused quite a bit of consternation. And it was the last issue that faced us in terms of trying to explain how it was that only a protein could cause these diseases. Strains or distinct varieties of prions are distinguished by different properties, including incubation times and neuropathology profiles. A single strain of prions retains a specific set of properties as it replicates with a high degree of fidelity. And varieties or strains of prions are reminiscent of strains of viruses, bacteria, fruit flies, even inbred mice. But here all the information is encoded in a nucleic acid. 
So how is it that strains can exist when only a protein is present? Well, the answer came from a set of studies that we were carrying out which were not geared in this direction. There was already a clue from Richard Marsh and Richard Besson, but not many people paid much attention to that clue because the prions had come from a mixture that probably be began in a cow in the United States and then was, were transmitted into mink and then into hamsters and then separated by incubation times. This study had a completely different origin. From Ruth Gabazon, we received uh, inocula from patients dying of the 200 mutation and from Pierre Luigi Gambetti, uh, inocula from patients dying of fatal familial insomnia. Now, Gambetti and his colleagues had already shown that there was a difference in the uh, migration on gels between uh, <coughs> the protein from patients with a 200 mutation and patients with FFI. And he did that first by treating with proteases and then stripping away all the carbohydrates. Glenn Telling's contribution to this was to transmit the disease into mice carrying this chimeric mouse-human PRP gene and finding that if the prions originated with the codon 200 mutation, that there was a 21 kilodalton protein and it could be serially passaged and it remained 21 kilodaltons. If it began with the patient with FFI, it was 19 kilodaltons, serial passage remained 19 kilodaltons, 130-day incubation time. Now the incubation times were separated, and all of the definitions of strains were met. In fact, there were even markedly different neuropathologies. This simply shows you the actual data from the familial CJD patient, the mouse, the FFI patient, and the mouse. And the neuropathology of, that Steve DeArmond carried out is shown here, where in the mouse we recapitulate the deposition of PRP scravy confined largely to the thalamus uh, with FFI as the inoculum and with familial CJD. You see the entire cortical mantle is stained as well as a number of deep structures including the hypothalamus. So we then came to the conclusion that the strain of the prion is enciphered in the tertiary structure of PRP scrapie, and that the species of the prion is encoded in the PRP sequence, that is, the last mammal in which the prion was passaged. So the conformations of PRP scrapie are shown here. We have two different strains signified by blue and yellow, starting with one PRPC molecule, which is then templated onto the PRP scrapie, and we either produce a blue one or a yellow one. And as I already mentioned earlier, there's other data which now can be interpreted very readily from uh, Richard Marsh and Richard Besson, which argues for this concept where this was determined completely independently from studies in mink. So I think we have to think about protein folding in a different way. In the Anfinson model, and these, this is a <coughs> These are studies that are real classics in biochemistry uh, carried out by Chris Anfinson many years ago. There was one structure for a single uh, sequence. And if the sequence was slightly different from species to species, it was approximately the same structure. But in the prion story, here we have p human PRP, which can exist, or mouse PRP, uh, which can exist, in as PRPC and strain one and strain two. So we have at least three different structures. So we have multiple structures of PRP scrapie, which really force us to think differently about protein folding and how it is that a protein can exist in multiple conformations. I'll be done in a moment. I'm waiting for the next. Do we have any water? <laughs> I don't think so. Hold on a moment. But I have some in this bag. <laughs> you brought it from the States? <laughs> right. This, this, this comes from uh, Great Britain. <laughs> it's, it's an American invention. It's a Coca-Cola. 
was never supposed to be any good, though. People didn't like the name. Now, what I would like to close with is to tell you where some of these studies are headed. And to tell you about a ser series of studies, very briefly, in which we've been able to make an artificial or mini prion. And it begins with a model Fred Cohn put together of these four putative helical regions. And then what happened was that Tamaki Muramoto, a postdoctoral fellow, and the studies have been carried on by uh, Suchai Sudaponi uh, after uh, Tamaki Muramoto returned to Japan. What Tamaki Muramoto did was to remove each one of these regions individually. And what he found was that only this middle region could be removed and still a PRP scrapie molecule could be formed. So the green was completely removed. And a P this, is, this is now a model based upon the NMR structure shown here. Uh, what we're left with is a model where we think that this long helix remains. We know that the disulfide that connects this helix with that helix, in fact, it occurs right down here, has to remain intact. Uh, and the protein X binding site, we know, is intact, but that means that a new site has been formed, either just on this helix or some of this yellow coil region, and we can't determine exactly what that is yet. Now, what we found was that in cultured cells that we could form a scrapey molecule. But more importantly, in transgenic mice, as I'll show you in a moment, we can make the mice sick, and they have very short incubation times of about 60 days, and they show spongiform degeneration. So if we inoculate the mice that carry this transgene, they're on a null background, so the wild-type mouse PRP gene is missing. It takes about 250 days for the animals to get sick. But now, in their brains, they're carrying these mini prions of 106 amino acids in the scrapey conformation. And if we now inoculate those into mice that carry this transgene, again, on the null background, we see that in 60 days, the mice are getting sick and dying of the disease. The initial mice carrying the transgene but inoculated with wild-type prions carry the protease-resistant protein when they get sick. And here, we've inoculated with the uh, mini prions, and you see the protease-resistant form in these mice. It doesn't get smaller. There's no shift because the entire end terminus is missing, as well as that huge region in the middle. And here you see the spongiform change in the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus and in the striatum. And what's so remarkable is that there is this dramatic, and this is Steve DeArmond's work, this dramatic loss of pyramidal neurons. This is the normal set of pyramidal neurons in the hippocampus, and all of them are just virtually, the cell bodies are completely missing uh, in these animals. So we think that these mini prions will help us decipher the structure of PRP scrapie because they have much different properties. They're soluble in detergents when they're made in cultured cells, and we think the same thing will happen with brain uh, with the proper detergent treatments. So what I've told you today is that PRPC can be transformed into PRP scrapie, and that it's wild-type PRPC in the sporadic and infectious forms of the disease, and that multiple strains are different conformers. In the inherited forms of the disease, it is mutant PRPC which is transformed into mutant PRP scrapie. And again, there can be different strains which represent different conformations. This has truly been a journey from heresy to orthodoxy. And what I've told you is that prions contain only protein, a protein called PRP scrapie and no nucleic acid. A chromosomal gene encodes PRP scrapie and its precursor PRPC. Mutations in the PRP gene cause the inherited prion diseases. PRP scrapie is formed from PRPC as the protein changes its conformation. Prion strain-specific information is enciphered in the conformation of PRP scrapie. And in cavioli, we believe that PRP scrapie acts as a template directing the conversion of PRPC into PRP scrapie. 
Now, as Stefan Normark mentioned in his introduction, we believe that not only are prions important in terms of disease, but in terms of metabolic regulation. And that prions have opened up a new field in terms of the dynamic plasticity of protein structure. They may operate in transient metabolic regulation. He mentioned stable metabolic states, yeast and fungal prions. And they may, in fact, be important in multicellular organisms in terms of homeostatic control, for instance, of polypeptide hormones. Now, we can look at these diseases two different ways. We can look at them as simply infectious proteins and look at this list that I've talked to you about of scrapie, of mad cow disease, of CJD, GSS, and FFI. Or we can think about these as disorders of protein conformation, and we can then begin to expand our thinking and wonder if similar kinds of mechanisms with different proteins and clearly not so far demonstrated to be infectious in these animal models, but many, many aspects of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and ALS. And we can even expand our thinking to think about diabetes of adult onset, not the juvenile type, and perhaps even some of these uh, disorders uh, that uh, are the province of psychiatrists, which we, as neurologists, believe one day will be neurologic diseases. Now, how do we treat these diseases? We believe that the treatment will come through interfering with the binding of PRPC to protein X at this epitope that has been defined by Kiyotoshi Kaneko. And there are a large number of people working with Fred Cohn and myself to try to find drugs that will do just that. It may also be possible to produce cattle or sheep which are resistant by simply adding a transgene. Another way to do this, of course, is to knock out the PRP gene, but that's a much more elaborate process. And we don't know the consequences of that. Now, obviously people are very concerned about mad cow disease in Europe. And there is concern in the United States, and there's already legislation being drafted to prevent the use of meat and bone meal, which is not widely used, but there is some use of it in the United States, and I think that will uh, cease very shortly. Now, there's another kind of disease in the United States. It's called mad bull disease. And it is for the economists to tell us about that disease. And I think the Nobel laureates can give us a much better insight into that disease than I can, so I won't try. Now, I want to end and see how many of you read the poster that you were given. Now, if you read that poster, you can answer this quiz, which appeared in the Chicago Tribune on October 12, 1997. So it says, Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering a new type of germ that was described as being like which of the following? Dracula, Jenkel and Hyde, Wolfman, Xena, the warrior princess. <laughs> OK, so raise your hands if you think it's A. <laughs> this is for the students. It's B, Jenkel and Hyde. And that's on the poster. When shaped one way, the germ is benign, but if folded differently, it causes disease. And with that, I'll close and say thank you.